At 17.30 GMT, you're watching Biz Africa. Mining and energy companies from the developed world operating in Africa should pay more taxes to help the continent's countries climb out of poverty. That's according to the president of the African Development Bank, Donald Kabaruka. He told that he mentioned that to Reuters, arguing that Africa was being ripped off on a grand scale and it had become a collective agenda to make sure that everyone pays what is due. He made those comments on the sidelines of the G8 summit, which opened in Northern Ireland on Monday, which is focusing on trade, transparency and tax, now referred to as the Triple T agenda. Kabaruka said that Africa was seeking to grow itself out of poverty through trade and investment and it would work to ensure that there's transparency and sound governance in the natural resources sector. The United Kingdom has turned up the pressure on other countries to clamp down on secretive cash flows by pressing its overseas tax havens into a deal on transparent tax disclosure. To that end, it has announced new disclosure rules for British companies. In line to the recent news that Apple, Google, Starbucks and other multinationals are now facing much, much closer scrutiny around their corporate tax structure in different countries, it's not surprising the chief executives right around the world are now reconsidering how they approach this fairly thorny issue and the potential damage it can cause on their corporate brands. CCTV's Angela Coppola reports in a recently conducted survey as the G8 summit opens in Northern Ireland, which is expected, as we've just mentioned, to touch on tax avoidance, among other matters. Tax avoidance is the key theme that will be discussed at next month's G8 summit in Northern Ireland. Some analysts are calling for the structures to be thrown out, suggesting that applying a band-aid to the problem won't resolve the issue. It does appear that many companies only apply the tax rules and haven't considered the reputational risk. Cor Kramwinkel, Associate Director in Corporate and International Tax at PwC, explains why. Morality, ethics, desire, wish of the population um, needs to come into play when the policymakers decide what rules do I need to draft in order for me to achieve that objective. The company is only there to apply the rules that they have given and not to make decisions on what may be fair in the eyes of some and unfair in the eyes of others. Carl Herika, head of corporate tax at MTN South Africa, says that businesses will enter countries where they have certainty from a legal, commercial and tax perspective. These companies will also generally serve their key stakeholder interests in terms of providing shareholder value. It's no secret that a company exists to, exist to create shareholder value and shareholder wealth, right? And ultimately, tax plays an important part there, right? And if you can legally right, minimize your tax, right, there should be no problem with that whatsoever. Tax practitioners will tell you that they work within the rules and the laws of the land that their businesses operate in. Increasingly, though, it appears that they are becoming more aware of the softer, more emotive issues that don't really have a place in tax considerations. It's a difficult balancing act uh, that uh, any tax director in, in an organisation needs to be aware of. Um, yes, uh, we, we can only operate in terms of what the law is before us, and that's what we need to do. Um, but at the same time, you need to have this broad awareness on the impact for the reputation of the business as a whole and what that might do to the to the value of the brand so it needs to be taken into consideration and very often that that boils down to making sure that the commercial drivers for whatever is being done from a tax perspective and that the necessary substance to those arrangements is given effect to the unwelcome light of public attention on several american multinationals and their tax strategies will serve as a warning to their ceo compatriots around the world it's also an opportunity for regional economic groupings in africa to take best practices in tax and build African solutions that meet their revenue demands. While tax planning might be a boring topic for some of us, corporate CEOs are going to start paying more attention because their stakeholders are going to start applying more pressure and make them more accountable from an ethical and moral perspective. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV in Johannesburg. Let's expand this conversation now and rope in CCTV's Melanie Ralph. She's live in London, keeping a close eye on developments from the G8 summit. Uh, Melanie, let's start with the central bank story and the story about monetary policy. Uh, with respect to the reduction of QE, that really doesn't mean the end of easy money because rates really aren't going to rise for the next couple of years. So in light of that theory, was the emerging market currency sell-off overdone? 
Well, Rama, that's a good question. Actually, the Fed tapering its massive bond buying program can have a positive effect on emerging markets, which had nothing to do with the rates, but more to do with the fundamentals. If the Fed is thinking of turning off the tap of liquidity, then they must believe the underlying U.S. economy is getting stronger and emerging economies would certainly benefit from a stronger U.S. economy. So some analysts are pointing to other factors that would keep pressure on the RAND, that being civil unrest in the mining sector and poor growth projections. So although the Fed tapering would bring a period of uncertainty in the short term for the markets that have been um, addicted to central bank intervention, markets and rates should settle soon after. Indeed. Let's move on to the tax deal. What details do we have about the plan that's been be that's being put forward by David Cameron? Will the sharing of tax information be limited to national authorities or will that extend to the public as well? Yeah, well, at the moment, Cameron is falling short of announcing a publicly available list of tax information. Let's be clear. The UK Prime Minister and host of the G8 meeting, David Cameron, is pushing for two things. One is for G8 countries to sign up to an action plan disclosing who owns shadowy shell companies linked to money laundering, tax evasion, corruption and terrorist funding. And there still isn't a defined timescale for this. The other area is tax avoidance. There is a push for G8 members to agree on automatic sharing of tax information. The fear here is that the poorest countries will be left out of this scheme and that the African nations won't know what information to request about firms accused of exploiting their natural resources as they often have little idea where exactly the money ends up. So there are still a lot of loose ends to tie up on this highly charged topic and we could hear more in the next few months. Speaking of teeth, what, what teeth will an agreement of this scale really have if there's no tax reform from a legislative perspective to back it up? Well, let's put it this way. There's certainly impetus for clearer tax legislation. Looking at some of the reported figures, global tax evasion could be costing more than $3 trillion a year with as much as $32 trillion hidden in tax havens. That's according to research from the Tax Justice Network. So the numbers we're talking about can't be ignored. There is, however, still resistance met by some over tax transparency. So again, don't expect things to happen overnight on this. And some analysts aren't foreseeing groundbreaking decisions and legislation reform coming out of this summit Fearing it be long on rhetoric and short on substance. Couldn't find better words to end that on. Thank you very much for your insights. That's CCTV's Melanie Ralph live in London, keeping a very close eye on development from Northern Ireland where the G8 summit is taking place. Now, speaking of money, Africa will need a lot more than just $93 billion every year to fund its infrastructure development projects. CCTV Sumitra Naidu now reports that while the World Bank made that estimate back in 2009, the continent's needs have grown a lot more since then, and there must be concerted investment in infrastructure if this continent's economy is asked to sustain economic growth at an average of well over 5%. Africa has grabbed the world's attention. The continent is reporting the strongest growth in any other region except for Asia. Investors have thus far shown keen interest in being part of the region's development, but Africa's infrastructure needs are enormous. That uh, remains a big challenge uh, all over Africa, uh, but uh, through regional um, uh, collective efforts, it can be easier to have railways, airports, uh, seaports, and uh, use them jointly and then speed up the uh, ease of doing business, the logistics and uh, so on, same for electricity and so on. Africa needs $93 billion a year for its infrastructure development projects. Almost half of that is currently funded by the African Development Bank. For the rest, Africa needs investors. According to Ernst & Young's attractiveness survey, despite a 12% drop in foreign direct investment across the world, FDI into Africa is still robust. So though globally FDI flows have reduced, Africa has managed to increase from a, a good 3% to 5.6%. South Africa remains the biggest investor on the continent, with companies like PPC expanding vigorously. Following recent acquisitions in Ethiopia and Rwanda, there are plans in place to begin cement production in these two countries, as well as in the DRC and Zimbabwe in the next two years. 
PPC says it's positive to see the continent has now moved away from resource-based industries and is becoming more diversified. Countries have to start focusing on the areas of their strength. There are some countries that are good at resources, based industries, and others that are not. There are those that are already ahead of the game in terms of services industry. There are those that are much more financial services inclined. And it's just about knowing which country has which strength and making sure that they focus on that. Africa now boasts some of the fastest growing economies in the world, with an average growth rate of just over 5%. Rwanda is leading the way with a growth rate of over 7%. The country rebuilt itself after its economy was obliterated following the genocide 19 years ago. It has become an example for the rest of the continent. The key factors is uh, transparency in governance, that's number one, so corruption is uh, not uh, tolerated in Rwanda. Then number two, uh, making easy registration of companies, making easy um, for uh, foreign direct investors to also work in Rwanda. But to optimize its potential, Africa will have to start acting as a unified force and not as individual states. While countries like Rwanda, Sierra Leone and Ethiopia are recording strong growth levels, ensuring that growth is sustainable needs a collective effort from all countries on the continent. The African Development Bank says infrastructure development needs to be speeded up so that countries have better integration and better access to the markets. Sumit Ranadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Over on the East Coast, the Kenyan economy is expected to grow by 5.3% this year, way higher than the 4.7% recorded in 2012, supported by low interest rates and higher FDI flows. According to the country's economic update launched by the World Bank earlier on Monday, a stable macroeconomic environment, peaceful elections held in March this year, and a smooth handover of political power all offered a solid base to support growth to 6% through to 2014. But the World Bank's country director, the Aretu Gai, said East Africa's biggest economy needs to do much, much more to achieve the target growth of 10% per year, as laid out in Kenya's economic blueprint, Vision 2030. Now, she pointed out that creating an enabling environment for the private sector-led growth by continuing to invest in infrastructure, increasing domestic energy production, and sustaining sound monetary policies while removing bottlenecks to doing business is all absolutely critical. We're taking a short break on Biz Africa. Here's what's coming up next. Central African state set 2020 as the deadline to end the export of raw materials. We'll add the details on that when we return. Africa, an amazing world, is coming closer to us. A new voice. We have made an excellent beginning. A new view. Let's watch together. We deliver news and views. Let's explore together. We get you inside real Africa. Every day, only on CCTV News. Welcome back. Let's uh, move on to North Africa now, where Egypt has been suffering from energy shortages for the past two years. Now, the problem has been magnified by a lack of funds and a growing budget deficit at government level, which is hampering the state's ability to import fuel and diesel supplies. Now, a group of investors and businessmen held a conference in Egypt to discuss the problem, and they put so forward their solutions from an investor's perspective. CCTV's Yasser Hakim was there. Energy shortages continue to be a hurdle to Egypt's economic and social development, more so in the summer, as consumption nearly doubles and electricity cutouts become a daily routine. Power outages are not only affecting uh, households, but they are also affecting industries, they are also affecting hospitals, they are also affect, affecting schools. So. Without, with continued power outages, Egypt will have a severe competitiveness problem. We will not be able to export, we will not be able to increase our productivity. 
That is why a group of businessmen and experts gathered to plan their vision to solve the energy crisis. These conferences have been held for years and years about the potential of Egypt in solar power, for example. The difference here today is we, it's a private sector conference that is looking at where we can invest our money as private sector companies in renewable energy. So today we're moving from talking to actual investments. Citing alarming numbers such as Egypt's annual fuel consumption of 37 million tons costs $33 billion and is sold subsidized at $6 billion only. A subsidized $1 gas cylinder costs the government $15 each, whilst most alarming is that only 20% of the population consumes 80% of energy, a clear sign of mismanagement of resources. To minimize the drain on our resources by first um, doing economic impact analysis of who are the people who deserve the subsidies, over how many years we can eliminate or rationalize the subsidies? What are we going to, how much savings can we generate over how many years? What do we do with the savings? Do we use them to plug the budget deficit hole or do we use them to be reinvested in alternative energy? There is also the renewable energy projects that experts have been calling for years to be implemented in Egypt. In this conference, we have managed to secure preliminary joint venture deals with foreign investors to solve electricity problems through solar energy. In only 18 months, we can produce 3 gigawatts and 1 extra mega every year. We just need government approvals to begin. The paperwork takes ages. On the other hand, investors commended the government for its plans to reduce subsidies on sources of energy to balance the state's budget deficit. Reducing subsidies on petrol and fuel is essential for the budget of the country, but experts say it has to be done in a delicate and professional way to avoid political unrest and violence. This is Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Now, given, of course, that the bulk of Egypt's energy requirements are met by hydrocarbons, that should give you a vague idea of the scale of the problem that this country faces. Let's get some more insights into that. CCTV's Yasser Kim is the business correspondent in Egypt, who joins us now live uh, from Cairo. In your package, Yasser, from a government minister, no less, government bureaucracy was listed as one of the key problems to getting projects off the ground. What's the key, what's being done to resolve that problem? Yes, it's funny coming from a minister of petroleum, uh, a member of government, but just to give you an idea about how bureaucracy is killing investments in Egypt, um, you, you can now uh, establish a company in one week. There's no problem in that, and the government have solved that problem. But to allocate a piece of land and get the paper ready to construct uh, a project, uh, any kind of project, uh, uh, of, uh, um, any uh, company, any uh, um, factory will cost will, will take at least two years two to three years just to start construction after two to three years of paperwork and this is the problem that's facing the government right now uh, the government is trying to say that we will give you uh, some kind of paper uh, agreement that you can uh, start work uh, in six months uh, preliminary agreement but uh, to change the bureaucracy you need uh, new laws new legislation and this will take time uh, with the political haggling that's happening in the country and no uh, parliament right now, so uh, it will take time. The government is trying to find a way through to finish it, uh, paperwork in six months until the legislation is passed. Indeed, speaking of government issues, in 2007, the strategy that was set up for the development of Egypt's electricity sector saw about seven or so gigawatts of wind power potential in the country alone by the year 2020. Now, given the political and legislative challenges that you've just mentioned, is that plan still viable? No, it's dead. Uh, the uh, only two wind uh, power stations are working now in Egypt. One is uh, called Zafarana and one uh, Hargada. And they only uh, are working at 1.7 billion kilowatts per hour. Uh, Egypt's total consumption is 136 billion. So that's minimal, that's nothing. And uh, all this plan about 2020 uh, was done by the former uh, regime and now it's not, it's, it has dead actually by the former the regime because of corruption and it's not uh, been a re uh, not nothing new has happened after the revolution so uh, windfall has 
basically stopped right now. They're concentrating on other things like solar energy. Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being, though. Thank you very much for your time. That's CCTV's Yasser Kim live in the Egyptian capital of Cairo. Let's move on now. Presidents from six Central African states have set the deadline of the year 2020 for proposal to stop the exports of primary commodities before value addition. Now, the tentative move to ban the export of raw commodities essentially aims to retain more of their value in their countries of origin through beneficiation while creating additional jobs and raising the overall standard of living. CCTV's Peter Okaba reports from Gabon. The heads of state from the Economic Community of Central African States, which includes Gabon, the Central African Republic, Equatorial Guinea, Chad, Republic of Congo and Cameroon, and a guest country, Senegal, say they intend to move towards a system where they export only refined goods, as this will enable them to retain more of their income from their commodities. We will not export primary commodities by 2020. We need to optimize value chains. When Gabon banned the export of timber in 2010, jobs and revenue jumped by 40%. Gabon started off on the path of beneficiation in the year 2010, and other nations are keen to follow its example. Many of the initiatives being encouraged are targeted at benefiting the youth. I want to reiterate that our continent's priority is our youth, especially when it comes to employment. If Africa's youth is left without educational jobs, our continent's growth will be pointless. For many at the New York Forum, the fact that Africa is rising and that it is no longer in economic doldrums is a plus. Larry Summers is a former economic advisor to President Barack Obama, and he highlights that sourcing of capital at a macro level for much of Africa is no longer a major challenge. Within the last year, Cote d'Ivoire, just past civil war, has borrowed at lower cost than Greece. Senegal has borrowed at lower cost than Portugal. Zambia has borrowed less expensively than Spain. Ghana has borrowed at lower cost than Ireland. Nigeria and Angola have both borrowed at lower cost than Italy, and Gabon has borrowed at lower cost than Belgium and than Chile. Despite all the optimism, though, the atmosphere is tempered by the fact that many of the leaders will have to find a way to create a balance between social, environmental and economic imperatives in order to achieve a wholesome development. The New York summit then is the culmination of a summit that brings together heads of states from the economic community of the Central African states. The forum expected them to enable them to debate issues that will push them further along the road of integration and also deepen their economic cooperation. We talk about CCTV in Libreville, Gabon. Right, the Africa rising narrative does continue, albeit with a few speed bumps along the way. Quick run through the indices for you. Keep in mind, of course, the JSC wasn't trading today. There was a public holiday down in South Africa. The rest of the markets, however, firmly in the red, except Egypt and Nigeria, all shared down by four tenths, as I mentioned earlier. The JSC closed for the day. Uh, in Nairobi, the 20 share index, the bear run we saw last week, still very much in force today, down by almost a four percentage point. The Egyptian market, however, ending the day higher, 1.2. That's Biz Africa for you this Monday. We'll be back here with the same content tomorrow.